This is a JVC KS AX504 car amp uh, that I have uh, completely restored and uh, then I have completely hacked it to shit because uh, I like it and I want to use it for myself. Uh, and it has a few issues and my application is kind of specific, uh, so I've done some modifications. Uh, so this is a 90s, mid 90s, I think this is from 96, uh, class AB car amp, 40 watts per channel with decent distortion. Uh, this one tests at like 0.02-ish across most of its uh, range, which is really good for a car amp. Uh, you won't get figures like that out of anything but a really expensive modern class D amplifier. Uh, and I got a few of these uh, basically for free, uh, so hey, why not do something with them? Uh, and what uh, really made me basically fall in love with this guy is that is, you can tell that this was designed by someone who cares. If you take a look at it, you can see that there's a really nice symmetry to, to the design. It's split down the middle, you have uh, four channels uh, in, in each corner and all the circuitry is like physically shoved closed uh, and it's just really easy to follow up what is what and it makes sense where all the parts are. It, it's, it's just a really nice, beautiful, sensible design. You, you can just tell that someone, whatever Japanese guy designed this, he, he, he put his heart and soul into it and it really shows. And I want to honor that by uh, giving these guys a second life. Uh, so, of course, I started by just recapping this guy, fixing the solder joints uh, all, on all of and with this basic design. Uh, all the power devices on by the sides will get bad solder joints in the long run, and this was no exception. So I resoldered all of that, all the heavy and hot components, the standard issue, here, yeah, amp restoration sort of thing. Uh, and it turned out really well. However, uh, this thing is built down to a price. It was a sort of... Mm, upper mid-range amp uh, but uh, they did still have to make some compromises one of the main one was main one what main ones was that uh, it was a fixed bias design uh, they had just used uh, fixed resistors to set the bias on each channel and this particular one uh, this channel had all the bias and the others had none so it had a ton of crossover distortion, uh, which I didn't like. Uh, but thankfully, the design is very, very simple. Uh, so you can actually just add your own bias adjustment potentiometer, which is what I did. I modified uh, this resistor here, the value, I think it was 2.7K from a factory. Uh, I turned it into a 2.2K and added a potentiometer, 2K potentiometer on all the channels. So I now have a adjustable bias and once you actually tune it in properly uh, it has a really nice stable uh, well tracking bias it biases beautifully as long as you have a potentiometer and that completely fixed the uh, crossover distortion issue i was having uh, which gave this thing really nice analog performance i'll uh, link in a uh, performance report i did on it like it's really nice it's low noise it's it's just a hi-fi amplifier basically but it had another very big weakness, and that is the power supply. Uh, this thing, uh, because of how it's built, uh, it, it, it's kind of cheap on the power supply side, and there's just a ton of crosstalk coming through between the channels uh, on uh, the power supply rails. Like a ridiculous amount. Uh, you can play music into uh, two other channels and uh, if you turn the music up to like 50% power you can very easily and loudly hear the music coming out of the channels which have no input signal which is not good especially for the application I was using this thing in which is to drive two front car speakers and a subwoofer uh, when I put this in the car in its original uh, sort of configuration if I turned the subwoofer off on the head unit there would still be enough signal coming through to the sub uh, that uh, you could measure it. It was like, like I'm not joking, you have like minus 20 dB damping on the unused channels. It was a ridiculous amount of uh, crosstalk. Uh, and uh, the design is actually fairly uh, discreet. Uh, the only really shared part between all the, the uh, channels is uh, this op-amp. Uh, there are like uh, separate input stages, you can see these are all the input coupling caps which go to one of each channels on this quad op amp 
But when we split out into the uh, rear channels and the front channels, uh, and everything from there on is completely separate. You have two stereo channels, vast sharing op amps, and two stereo channels here sharing op amps, but there's nothing between them other than the power supply. Yet I was getting ridiculous crosstalk from the uh, front channels to the rear channels. And it took me a while to figure out, but uh, I noticed they just have no uh, decoupling uh, on the uh, op amps at all. Uh, they have the uh, Zener regulated plus minus 15 volts uh, supply here, and that's just nothing. That's just copper traces going from here to there. Uh, all the caps here are actually part of a filter. They are not powered by coupling caps. Uh, so fixing the crosstalk issue was fairly easy. I just added a uh, cap across the plus and minus 15 volt pins on uh, one of each uh, op amp. Uh, in, in, the, in the areas, and that basically fixes the crosstalk issue. Uh, it's completely fine just by adding a tiny bit of decoupling there. Uh, now, uh, this thing uses a... Oh man, what's it called? Ah, I had to look it up. It uses a state variable filter uh, for the crossovers, which is a really neat uh, free op-amp filter which gives you a 12 dB uh, roll-off uh, on a high and low pass filter and a band pass filter uh, all in one. Uh, but it's only a 12 dB per octave roll-off, which is not good enough for a subwoofer. Uh, when I tried to put this into use with just uh, uh, the original filter, well, well uh, for starters I modified the filter range. You can see my uh, sticky notes there. Uh, the original filter range is uh, 50 hertz to 200 hertz. I wanted a lower, so I've uh, replaced some capacitors, uh, in particular uh, these. No, hang on. No, I'm lying to you. I haven't replaced any capacitors. I have tacked on extra capacitors on the underside of the board, namely uh, these four caps uh, are the uh, capacitors for the uh, state variable filter, and these guys for the other channels. There are actually capacitors on the underside of the board. Uh, these are point, uh, I think they're 40, 470 or 47 puff. They're just doubled on the other side of the board, so I've doubled the capacitance, which uh, halves the crossover frequency. So instead of 50 to 200, I get 25 to 100, uh, which is much more in line with what I want in my application. Uh, and for the rear channels, I've also modified. One of the reasons I really like this app is that it has a tiny bit of EQ built in. It has a bass boost filter. Uh, you can just gain up the low frequencies uh, up to 12 dB. Uh, 45 Hz by default, which is uh, original on the front channels, uh, but on the rear channels I want to battle lower uh, to compensate for the characteristics of my subwoofer. Uh, so I've dropped that to 30 Hz by adding uh, these capacitors over here. Uh, so, I now have a much more suitable uh, filter set up on this amp. The original filters aren't bad, but they're sort of built for, you know, 90s car stereo built-in speakers, where 50 to 200 hertz crossovers and 45 hertz boost is exactly what you want, because you're not going to get anything lower than that out of them. But since I'm using a proper subwoofer, I'm running a, a, a recycled uh, Adam Sub 7, uh, which is actually a st studio, studio subwoofer, which goes down to mm, just under 30 hertz without problems. Uh, I needed something better. And above all, I needed something sharper, because even with these modifications, the uh, state variable filter is still only 12 dB per octave, which is really, really uh, shallow. So I was getting way too much high frequencies uh, coming through to the subwoofer, which was just making it sound like well, a cheap car stereo. It, it, it just sounded terrible uh, and I couldn't get good response. I was getting like a giant hump at around 100 hertz no matter what I did. Uh, so I had to do something about that. And to do that I have modified the input buffer op-amp circuit. Uh, so this op-amp here is the ballast, balanced input stage. This thing does have a very roughly balanced input stage. Uh, you can actually hook uh, your car head unit straight up to the RCAs. These are not ground referenced. They are actually independent, uh, basically balanced. They use the positive and input, uh, negative input on the op-amp. Uh, uh, another reason why I really like this amp, you don't need to have a low level converter to use it. Uh, but, uh, I've modified two things in, uh, well, three things basically in this part of the circuit. Uh, 
for the subwoofer, I've just added across uh, uh, this capacitor, which is usually just a like uh, really megahertz-ish uh, frequency rejection cap uh, and uh, that capacitor I've also which have basically the same uh, uh, function I've added a 220 nano and a 100 nano cap across them which gives me a uh, 260 db per octave first order filters at uh, like 50 60 hertz something like that each I never did the maths, but they start rolling off pretty quickly. I maybe they might be even lower. They might be like 30, 40 hertz each. Uh, but that uh, basically adds to the slope of the state variable filter and gives me 24 dB per octave uh, roll off uh, at the cost of the rear channels not being able to ever put out full range, which I don't care about. They're, they're only ever going to drive the subwoofer. Uh, so the sound now has a reasonably val variable uh, 24 dB per octave filter from you know, 25 hertz to 100 hertz which is good for driving a subwoofer it's sharp enough it fixed the high frequencies going into the sub issue now it since this thing like this thing is more or less intended to be used with a low level input they've just also made it possible to use it with a head unit so it had a bit more gain that I wanted on the front channels uh, because uh, you would not get some noticeable noise being just amplified from the uh, power amp IC in the head unit uh, because there was just so much gain even at the lowest uh, input uh, level setting. Uh, so what I've done there is I've just added a couple of resistors, that guy and that guy, uh, across the positive and negative input pins on the uh, front uh, channel's op amp. Uh, and that just lowers the gain a bit, maybe by 50%-ish. I, I didn't do any math. I just took a suitable resistor and uh, put a there and it uh, fixed the issue good enough for me. Although that does, uh, given how this circuit is constructed, that does lower the input impedance. Uh, so I also raised the size from these uh, golden input uh, caps. They were originally 4.7 microfarads. I turned these into 10 microfarad just to give me uh, some makeup for that because I was I would lose like a dB at 20 hertz or something if I didn't do that. And these ugly things I added just now uh, because again the power supply is a weakness of this uh, amplifier. Uh, it performs well, it has a switching frequency of about 45 kilohertz so the, the original uh, there's, two, uh, there's basically 2500 microfarads per rail uh, that's completely adequate for the switching frequency of the power amplifier. But this is a linear amp. It also deals with audio frequencies on the load side. So what I noticed was happening, which was adding to the crosstalk issue, was that if I was playing low frequencies, especially low fre frequencies at high power through the subwoofer, I would still get significant uh, ripple on the power supply rails just because the power supply doesn't really regulate fast enough it's a pretty ancient basic switching IC it wasn't really handling it well so there was a decent bit of audio waveform shaped noise on the power supply rails there's space to add more capacitance so I added 2 times 2200 just now just to make it ever so slightly better and I think that pretty much sums up everything I've done to this amp it's still only a uh, uh, four times 40 watt amp or you get, in my application, I get about 40 watts per channel into the front channels, which is absolutely fine. It's for the work van. It doesn't need to be super high power. And I get about 100 watts uh, bridge tied into my 8 ohm subwoofer, which is perfectly adequate. It's well sized for the uh, driver. So this is now a really, really nice and optimized amp uh, for my application. I'm super happy with it. And I'm super happy to get to use such a beautifully designed amp. Again, the fact that this thing is built by someone who cares just makes me so happy. This guy replaces, it replaces this horror show. This used to be the power amp in the van. This is a Hertz uh, HMP4D, a much more modern, nice, cool, fancy, class D amplifier, uh, which is absolute garbage. The output quality of this thing is 
rubbish. Roughly the same power level as uh, that guy. Uh, they're very comparable like that. But this thing doesn't ever drop below 0.2% DHD. And there's so much noise that I can't even get low uh, power level uh, measurements out of it. It's just complete rubbish. It's audibly bad. I always thought it turned it off. Uh, chucked it off to placebo. But no, this thing is actually horrible. If you think about buying one of these, do not. The trash. Complete and utter garbage. All right, so yeah, well, what, what, what else is there? Oh yeah, I have actually specified bias for this thing. Uh, I've uh, been measuring the crossover distortion on and off and uh, uh, adjusting it uh, until it performs well with no crossover distortion, hot or colds. So we have uh, 0.5 millivolts uh, across uh, like a meter to a meter uh, on the front channels. Uh, and I went for 0.3 millivolts a meter to a meter on the uh, rear channels, which will allow a slight amount of crossover distortion to the subwoofer, but it's a subwoofer, it doesn't matter. You cannot hear the crossover distortion at all. It, like, but I'd rather have a bit of the extra efficiency. It kills a watt or two of power consumption doing it that way. And uh, this work van, it often just sits on battery playing radio. Uh, so uh, every watt I can save is, uh, uh, you know, a couple of minutes of runtime gain before I have to. Uh, charge my poor battery again. Funnily enough, this thing barely uses any more power than the Class D thing it replaced because the Class D thing is was horribly inefficient for some reason. Just a bad design. Hmm. But yeah, there you go. The uh, JVC. Aren't they? Let's uh, let's get the proper bottom panel. The JVC. Uh, KS AX504. And its siblings, uh, the bigger and smaller ones, are basically the same thing. These are really nice amps. If you stumble across them, they're good. Pick them up, but uh, they are going to need uh, the solder joints on the uh, power devices fixed. Uh, also, uh, I should add, uh, this, this one has been in like a weird application. It has a ton of runtime hours on it, like thousands upon thousands. And it was still working just fine. Uh, a couple of the caps, like the small, uh, like these 2.2 microfarads here, they were sort of marginal, but nothing really like horribly wrong. Uh, all of the big caps, like 1000s there, the input uh, caps on the 12 volts, they were all perfectly fine. So very good, reliable build quality like that as well. I was uh, super surprised to see that. I recapped it anyway because I wanted to. I like doing that sort of thing. but. Uh, Caps wise, if you have one of these which has been like in normal automotive use, the caps are going to be fine. They're, they're, they're not going to be, need replacing anytime soon. There, there you go. Cheerio.